Hello everybody and welcome back to Creation Myths, where we take sciency sounding creationist claims and explain why they're wrong. Today's creation myth is the creationist claim that there is no macro evolution and the quotes are going to be important. Before we get into why the creationist claim is wrong, we have to explain what is macro evolution. Now there is a real definition and then there's the mess of creationist definitions. The real definition for macroevolution is evolution above the species level, so speciation and larger changes rather than changes within a species. Zimmer and Emlin in the second edition, the 2016 edition of their excellent evolutionary biology textbook, define macroevolution as evolution occurring above the species level, including the origination, diversification, and extinction of species over long periods of evolutionary time. So we're talking about speciation and broader evolutionary outcomes. I do want to make very clear, though, that when it comes to the distinction between macroevolution and microevolution, the distinction is the time frame and the degree of the outcomes. The processes are the same for the two. So microevolution is within species evolution. Often you hear that defined as changes in allele frequency over generation. The processes that do that also result in macroevolution, larger magnitude evolutionary changes, but it's those same processes operating over longer periods of time. Now, the creationist definition for macroevolution, or I should say macroevolution because it's not the correct definition, is a mess. Typically, creationists define macroevolution as evolution between kinds, referring to biblical kinds or arc kinds, but there's no specific threshold for what this means, and different groups and organizations and people have different definitions for what macroevolution actually means. So here are two representative samples. Answers in Genesis says macroevolution is a hypothetical process of unlimited variation that evolutionists believe transform one kind of living organism into a fundamentally different kind, such as the transformation of reptiles into birds or apes into people. Obviously, no one has ever observed anything remotely like this transformation, and the emphasis in that last sentence is mine, because as we're going to see, that's completely wrong. CMI, Creation Ministries International, has a simpler definition. They just call it new kinds of organisms, which is great, it's straightforward, it's quick, it rolls off the tongue, but it doesn't actually tell you anything about whether a thing is or is not macroevolution. Now, rather than get bogged down on what the definition is, we know what the correct definition is, and it doesn't matter what the creationist definition is, because whatever definition creationists pick, we can find observed examples of macroevolution. We could find them either happening in the lab experimentally or witness it happening in real time in nature. And we're going to spend the rest of our time here going through examples of macroevolution that creationists claim can't happen that we've observed. Our first example is going to be the evolution of a new feature, specifically feathers from reptile scales. Creationists often claim that over uh, the processes of evolution, you can't actually gain new stuff, you can only lose stuff. Well, here's a direct counterexample. So the transition from scales to feathers is very well understood. It involves changes to the expression pattern of regulatory genes in a developing embryo. And we're talking very small scale uh, changes spatially, right? So we're talking what is the pattern of gene expression on the skin of the organism. If it's like a checkerboard pattern with different uh, regulatory genes up and down regulated, you end up with reptilian scales. But if it's a radial pattern, you can end up with different types of feathers. And this figure from Harris 2002 shows a simple representation of how changes in a couple of genes lead to different feather morphologies. The cool thing about this is we can directly observe this transition by manipulating gene expression in the lab. So we can look at, for example, the development of scales on the limbs of developing birds, and then by changing the gene expression pattern at very small scales in those developing structures, we can actually cause things like feathers to grow instead of scales. So it doesn't take a whole lot to actually change those expression patterns. Now that's really cool, but it's, it's not in nature, right? Well, what we can do is then we can take those differences in gene expression and we can correlate those phylogenetically to different groups of organisms, uh, avian reptiles, which is to say birds, and non-avian reptiles. And we can correlate the changes in gene expression in those different lineages to the appearance of different types of feathers. So we can directly observe the changes in the lab and then show that those changes map to the development of those traits, in this case, new, fe uh, new feathers in 
nature. Now hold up, creationists might say, that's all well and good, but that's just a change within a species. That's not macroevolution. Okay, let's talk about the evolution of new species. There are a ton of examples of speciation that humans have observed. For example, HIV, the virus that causes AIDS, appeared in the early 20th century. It evolved from a virus called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus. We watched that happen in real time in the 20th century. That's an example of speciation. But let's talk about animals instead, because creationists, for no good reason, often reject microbes as examples. So let's look at an ongoing example of animal speciation right now in an insect called the apple maggot fly. Apple maggot flies are native to North America. They, uh, they usually eat hawthorn berries, um, which are also native to North America. Apples are not native to North America, but when they were introduced, apple maggot flies started eating apples. Now the interesting thing is the two subpopulations of apple maggot flies that eat hawthorn berries and apples, they have very little interbreeding between them due to a phenomenon called temporal isolation. That just means they reproduce at different times, and in this case, different times of year. In this figure from Bush 1969, the shaded regions indicate when apples and hawthorn berries are most available as food sources, and the solid and dashed curves represent when the larvae are emerging from their eggs for these two different populations. You can see that the apple subpopulation emerges much earlier in the year compared to the hawthorn feeding subpopulation. So changes to a food source are leading to reproductive isolation between these two subpopulations. Now that's not all, because this reproductive isolation is due to changes to their reproductive rhythms, their reproductive uh, cycles over the course of a year. Well, that's uh, due to genetic changes, ultimately. And what we can document in these two subpopulations is the accumulation of genetic differences that are actually incompatible with each other. So this is leading to a phenomenon called post-zygotic isolation, where they actually are capable of interbreeding, but the hybrids between the two subpopulations have lower fitness than either subpopulation on its own. This means that over time, these two subpopulations, and we're watching this happen right now in real time, are diverging from each other, becoming reproductively isolated, and becoming two separate species. This is a thing called sympatric speciation. It's speciation without a physical barrier, keeping the two groups apart. Unless you think this is limited to invertebrates, here's two species of bird that are also speciating in real time. The Central European black cap is undergoing sympatric speciation in a manner very similar to the way apple maggot flies are doing it. And on the island of Daphne Major in the Galapagos, there is a new hybrid species of finch that has appeared just in the last few decades, last 40 or 50 years, I think. Um, so that's two vertebrate examples of speciation occurring in real time right now. But hold up, creationists might say, we don't object to speciation. We think things speciated after they got off the ark. What else you got? Well, let me tell you. We also have a process called endosymbiosis. Now in the general sense, endosymbiosis is where a smaller organism lives inside a bigger one and they benefit each other. So like termites that have protists and bacteria in their gut that actually make the enzymes to digest cellulose from wood, that's an example of a symbiotic relationship or an endosymbiotic relationship. But what we're talking about here is the evolutionary process of endosymbiosis when a smaller organism is engulfed by a bigger organism and ultimately becomes part of that larger organism. This is how we got organelles, like mitochondria and chloroplasts. And you probably know from ninth grade biology, what are mitochondria? Yeah, it's the powerhouse of the cell, right? Everyone just said powerhouse of the cell and then went, oh yeah, I remember that. So mitochondria are from aerobic bacteria that got engulfed by an anaerobic early eukaryote or proto-eukaryote or whatever. And then chloroplasts are the photosynthetic organelles derived from cyanobacteria that allow plants and green algae and the related species to do photosynthesis. And this is a simple figure showing that process. The heterotrophic uh, host cell engulfs the photosynthetic bacteria. Rather than digest it, over time that bacteria becomes part of the cell, which is now photosynthetic. Okay, that's called endosymbiosis. And I tell you about this because we're watching this happen in real time right now. The example of this that I'll start with is a completely new type of green algae in a genus called Pollinella. 
A Paulinella is made up of species that are called amoeboid rhizarians. They're not true amoeba, but they kind of look like amoeba, uh, but they have shells. So you can see like, here's an example, and they got, they got this shell surrounding it. Okay, this is primary endosymbiosis is what's happening here, which is to say a prokaryote is being incorporated. Now, in, within the genus of Paulinella, most of the species are heterotrophs, and one of the things they eat is cyanobacteria. But two species of Paulinella are photoautotrophs. They have structures called chromatophores, and this is a chromatophore right here, and that is derived from cyanobacteria. But it doesn't share common ancestry as an organelle with the chloroplasts of plants and all the other green algae. We can actually sequence the DNA of the chromatophore because just like chloroplast, it has its own DNA, and we find that it is from a different species of cyanobacteria compared to all the other chloroplasts. So that's really cool. But even better, we know that this endosymbiosis is ongoing right now because this chromatophore has a larger genome than chloroplasts. One thing that happens during endosymbiosis is transfer of genes from the organelle to the nucleus of the larger organism that contains it. Well, in this case, that chromatophore genome is a lot bigger than a chloroplast genome, indicating that this process is not done. It is ongoing. Here is a representation of that gene transfer process. So you start with a heterotrophic cell. It eats some cyanobacteria. And over time, through horizontal gene transfer and endosymbiont gene transfer, you're moving genes from the photosynthetic structure into the nucleus of the organism. It becomes mixotrophic, meaning that it can do both photosynthesis and heterotrophy, but over time becomes an obligate Phototroph. It can only live by photosynthesis. And over that time, and you can see that in the figure, over that time, the genome of the chromatophore is reduced. That's what these little circles are showing. It gets smaller and smaller over time as more and more of those genes are transferred to the nucleus. And over here, this is where we are right now, where this process is ongoing. It's not done, but we can see that this is a reduced genome and this chromatophore is no longer a free living bacteria. It is a photosynthetic organelle. So that's primary endosymbiosis happening right now. Okay, but that's a microbe. What well, that doesn't, come on, that doesn't really count. Fine, let's keep looking at endosymbiosis, but this time let's talk about photosynthetic animals. There are a ton of examples of ongoing secondary endosymbiosis in animals. And by secondary endosymbiosis, we mean that it's a eukaryote rather than a prokaryote being engulfed. Here are some examples. You've got sponges, You've got a hydra that's an idarian, and you've got a whole bunch of mollusks that are at various stages in this process. Basically, they eat algae, and to varying degrees, they incorporate either the algae or the photosynthetic structures from the algae and do photosynthesis as part of the way these animals make their living. Now, this is not just a case of symbiosis, where the animals and the algae live together with the algae living inside the animals. It's far more complex than that because we can actually document in some species transfer of genes from the algae into the nuclear genome of the animal. And that's what's going on here in this photosynthetic sea slug. It actually has genes for photosynthesis in its nuclear DNA. Now this one is at kind of an earlier stage because the uh, photosynthetic structures are not persistent. When the larva hatches, it has to eat the green algae, which is, what hap which is what is going on right here, and then it kind of steals them from its food. But other animals actually have persistent photosynthetic structures. Here is a vertebrate example of such an animal. This is a salamander that has photosynthetic endosymbiotic structures, and these are actually uh, transmitted vertically from parent to offspring. So these are developing salamanders in the eggs. You can see they're green. That's because they have the photosynthetic structures. Obviously, these eggs have not gone out and eaten any green algae yet, so that is a persistent photosynthetic endosymbiont in a vertebrate. So I think by any reasonable standard, we should be able to agree that photosynthetic animals count as macroevolution, or maybe I should say macroevolution. But we are not done because we have more evolutionary transitions to talk about. For example, viviparity. Viviparity refers to giving live birth rather than laying eggs. Now, most reptiles have oviparity. They lay amniotic eggs. And by reptiles, I mean things like snakes and lizards, but also birds. They lay amniotic eggs. But some lineages have evolved live birth. In fact, this has happened maybe up to 150 distinct times within reptiles.
The really cool thing is that some reptiles are evolving this in the present. We can see populations where there's a mix of oviparity and viviparity. In fact, there was a recently reported case where a reptile laid three eggs and then within the same litter gave live birth to one offspring. So we can see this happening in the present where there are lizards that are able to do both things simultaneously. Evolving this new trait involves a ton of new features, including a new type of placenta that is distinct from the placenta seen in mammals, but is structurally very similar. And here's the paper reporting that find. So we have not just a new trait, but the underlying genetic and morphological components that are required to make it work in a robust way. And then we could also talk about multicellularity. The evolution of multicellularity is something that has happened perhaps a few dozen times in the history of life on Earth. It is one of the major evolutionary changes, and we have now observed it de novo in the lab. And by de novo, I mean within a lineage that did not have multicellularity at any point in its evolutionary history. This was done with a species of unicellular green algae called Chlamydomonas, and what the researchers did here is subject them to predation. They basically introduced a selective pressure in the form of a predator and let that selection just go. And they found that the Chlamydomonas evolve obligate multicellularity, meaning they become completely multicellular with no unicellular stages in their life cycle. That's important because a lot of green algae can kind of go back and forth. They can be unicellular, they can be colonial. That's not true multicellularity. But when you only have groups of cells living and reproducing together, that's multicellularity. Now, for things like this, creationists like to claim that it's actually due to a loss of some kind of function, uh, like it lost the ability to be unicellular, but that's just simply not the case here. This evolution of multicellularity involves the evolution of a bunch of new traits, such as an extracellular membrane, which you can see kind of there, and you could, if you look closely, you could see it in the figure there. This membrane is what holds that group together. It allows the cells to stick together. We often see reproduction via multicellular structures called propagules, and you can see those right here. That is a completely new trait. The ancestral type of Chlamydomonas does not reproduce using propagules. So that is a completely new trait that had to evolve during this experiment. We watched it happen. The final thing I'll talk about is new information. Because some creationist organizations, rather than talk about groups of organisms or traits, they talk about this amorphous concept of information. For example, AIG says any real evolution, macroevolution, requires an expansion of the gene pool, the addition of new genes, genons, with new information. And CMI says these terms, which focus on small versus large changes, distract from the key issue of information. That is, particles to people evolution requires changes that increase genetic information, e.g. specifications for manufacturing nerves, muscle, bone, etc. Well, let's look and see if we can find any examples of new information. One observation that would meet the threshold would be a new protein function. And we see that in a protein called VPU in HIV-1 group M. VPU is an important and really interesting protein in HIV and the related SIVs. Its ancestral function that the SIVs and HIV-1 does is to degrade a protein called CD4 doesn't matter what CD4 is or what it does for the purposes of this discussion, but I'll just tell you that VPU in HIV-1 group M degrades CD4. It didn't lose its old function because creationists love to say, oh, well, it doesn't count if it lost its old function. Well, it kept it. The new thing that HIV-1 group M VPU does is called tetherin antagonism. Tetherin is a component of not just the human immune system, but lots of immune systems. All primates have tetherin too. And all SIVs have a way to get rid of tetherin or to deal with tetherin. That's called tetherin antagonism. Well, this is tricky for HIV because human tetherin is a little bit different. It's shorter than all the, pri the other primate tetherins. So the way the SIVs actually target tetherin doesn't work for humans because our tetherin is actually missing the part of the protein that all these other uh, SIVs would target to neutralize tetherin. HIV-1 group M got around this with VPU evolving the ability to antagonize tetherin through a completely new mechanism. It actually interacts with part of the tetherin protein that no other SIVs interact with. And you can see that in this figure here from Souter 2012. This uh, left side shows the CD4 interaction and the yellow dots indicate the important amino acids. On the right, we have the uh, tetherin antagonism and you can see the yellow dots indicate the important amino acid sites. 
The thing to keep in mind here is that these are new mutations that are different from the sites that interact with CD4. It's not one active site gaining a new function. It is a completely new function in a part of the protein that previously didn't do anything actively. This new trait involves at least four and possibly as many as seven new mutations, and you need to have the complete set of four in order to have the new activity, which in creation speak means it is an irreducible trait. But the evolution of this trait is not up for discussion. The SIVs without this VPU function can't infect humans. HIV with this function can. So this is an evolved, completely new, observed protein function. But look, creationists don't like stuff like this because it's just changing something that already existed. That doesn't really count as anything new. Fine, let's talk about de novo genes. Now, de novo genes are interesting because creationists also have silly standards for these. De novo just refers to a new gene that potentially does something completely new. When we're talking about this, creationists exclude gene duplication as a mechanism. But, like, gene duplication happens, so if you want to call that not macroevolution, that's fine. But all you're doing is expanding the universe of things that can happen without macroevolution. Same thing for HGT, horizontal gene transfer. That results in a lot of stuff. If you don't want to count that as macroevolution, fine, not my problem. You can get a lot of stuff via horizontal gene transfer that creationists are now implicitly saying is possible. Fine with me. But completely new genes should count as important uh, by any creationist standards, so let's look at how we can figure out how those occur. Well, we can observe that random sequences are an abundant source of bioactive RNAs and peptides, which means you can just randomly make uh, RNA polymers or polypeptides, and you see that they have like biological activity. That's cool. Now, an interesting question is whether that could happen in living things. It may be the case that living things uh, are going to be harmed when you're just making a bunch of like new polymers. But it turns out that's not the case. Random protein sequences can form structures in living things and are well tolerated. When we say in vivo here, we mean they're not doing this in a petri dish, they're doing this in actual living things. So this is showing that you can have like random protein sequences just in cells, and that like works fine. That's not going to cause any problems. So now we can put these together and say, can we explain de novo gene formation? And the answer is yes. Now I will clarify that I don't have any good lab examples of like, aha, that thing evolved a new gene in the lab. We have examples of that with gene duplication, but we don't have anything like what I'm about to tell you about. But these papers tell you the mechanism, because we know that random sequences are active, and we know that they're well tolerated. Well, are there any parts of the human genome, for example, that we know are transcribed and even translated sometime? Turns out, yes. Lots of the human genome, over 50%, is derived from mobile genetic elements like endogenous retroviruses or retrotransposons. These things are very frequently transcribed. So now we have an explanation for de novo genes, and we can, we can explain something that creationists love to bring up called orphan genes. Orphan genes are genes that don't have homologs in closely related species. So you have a gene in one species, but you can't find that gene in the related species. Creationists claim this is a problem for phylogenetics, which is wrong, but it's even more wrong now that we can explain where those orphan genes come from. The new term for those is de novo genes or taxonomically restricted genes, because we know to look for transcribed sequences like long non-coding RNAs to see if they have become de novo genes in specific lineages. And it turns out, now that we know where to look, we find them all the time. We can find these things in plants, we can find them in yeast, and we can even find them in hominoids, right? Human relatives. So we can look at hominoid-specific de novo protein encoding genes originating from long non-coding RNAs by saying, here's a taxonomically restricted gene or an orphan gene. Let's look at related species and see if they have long non-coding RNAs that match that gene sequence. And when we look, that's exactly what we find. So now we have examples of de novo gene formation and we've explained the creationist orphan gene thing that they incorrectly claim was a problem for phylogenetics. So to summarize, creationists claim macroevolution cannot occur. This despite creationists having many definitions for macroevolution, none of which are correct. But as we've uh, just explained here, the specific definition does not matter. By any reasonable standard, macroevolution has been observed. And I think this line that I'm about to show you really sums up the creationist problem here. I got this from the Debate Evolution subreddit, and I apologize to whoever wrote it. I couldn't find who it was when I went back and looked. The line is, 
Microevolution is evolution creationists can't deny. Macroevolution is evolution creationists must deny. But they're going to deny it, even though we can watch it happen. So, no macroevolution? That is a creationist myth. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Don't get fooled.